Welcome to the Church Leaders Podcast, where we're helping you lead better every day. And now here's your host. Hello, and welcome to the Church Leaders Podcast. I'm your host, Jason Day, and I am so excited to share this week's episode, which features a conversation I recently had with an incredibly godly, generous, and wise man, Eugene Peterson. Now, Eugene likely needs little introduction, as he is one of America's most well-known theologians. He has written dozens of books. He served as professor of spiritual theology at Regent College, and he was the founding pastor of Christ Our King Presbyterian Church in Maryland, where he served for 29 years before retiring. But perhaps Eugene is best known for his most widely read work, The Message, which he wrote to help make the original meaning of the Bible more accessible and understandable to contemporary readers. On this week's episode, Eugene reflects over his decades of ministry and shares how to navigate the tensions of leading a church. He speaks about the importance of finding rest and Sabbath as a pastor and why listening well is one of the greatest skills a ministry leader can possess. We also talk about his most recent book, As Kingfishers Catch Fire, which is a collection of powerful teachings he shared with his congregation across the years in Maryland. I trust you will enjoy as I invite you to listen in to my conversation with Eugene Peterson. First, I I just want to say thank you, Eugene, not only for the many contributions you've made to the church and to the lives of uh, countless Christ followers over the decades, uh, but I want to thank you specifically for your newest book, As Kingfishers Catch Fire. As I've been reading through it, I I truly believe it is a gift to the church. And in it, you're sharing 49 sermons that you preached over 29 years as you were shepherding your congregation outside of Baltimore. And uh, I I just uh, thank you for being a part of the Church Leaders Podcast today and excited to to hear from your heart. Well, thank you. I'm ready. Awesome. Well, in the preface of this book, you share that uh, 60 years ago, you found yourself somewhat distracted, that there are a great number of of things going on in the world and in the culture kind of swirling about you. And uh, you've been assigned by your denomination to plant a church outside of Baltimore, and you felt confident about your mission to lead. But as time went on, you found yourself sort of, as you mentioned, at odds with your advisors. So if you could talk to us a little bit, what were your challenges that you were experiencing between your calling, you know, your mission to lead and to shepherd that church, and the means and the methods that were being passed along to you? The church was not in good shape. There was a lot of dissension going on and a lot of volunteers uh, trying to start up new things. And uh, advisors were setting up um, seminars and uh, teaching us, those of us who were new church pastors, teaching us how to do it. And uh, I was I welcomed the help for to begin with, but later on I just realized that they're not they don't have any idea what a church does or what a pastor does, and they were showing us how to really end, was ending up being a consumer church, finding out what people wanted and then dishing it out to them, and so I. Uh, I just kind of got fed up with that. I, I went to one of these seminars, and the um, man who was the, who was directing it said, the most important thing you can do to have a good church is have a big parking lot. Wow. And, uh, so that was the end of it for me, so I just quit. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so I... And so I started trying to find out what, what was going on and and taking things out for myself. So um, that's how I started. And uh, the, the mega church became was that was the beginning of the mega church years. And uh, the the disappointing thing was that it worked. And um, except it didn't seem to be it seemed to me to be like a church. I thought pastors were supposed to be, um, well, pastors, knowing their people, knowing their names, uh, being in their homes and finding out what they, the way they lived and uh, trying to encourage them and show them the way of Jesus. So that's what that was about. 
Yeah, you. It's it's interesting because you um, you wrote there in the preface that leadership was interpreted almost entirely from business and consumer models, and I know that exactly. we 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 see that a lot even today. You know, over the years, um, you said that that the advisors um, were ensuring the numerical and financial viability of the congregation, but without even a footnote regarding the nurture of souls. I, I'm sure. Correct. Yeah, in our, in our audience, you know, uh, pastors and ministry leaders that listen to our podcast, I'm sure that many of them are, are wrestling with some of those same tensions, right, between um, what does it mean to be a pastor, as you said, where you know the, the people's names and you're concerned about their souls, and then a lot of what we hear about um, what leadership looks like. Uh, what would you say to those pastors who are wrestling with that, that same tension when it comes to leadership in the church? I get to know them first. And, uh, and to, just to learn how, what they think being a pastor is. And um, most of the time, when in those early years, uh, I realized that they, they had no idea what a pastor d- did. They just wanted to be in on something exciting, and it satisfied their desire for being important and for being effective. And, um, but the people that they were doing this with, they, were, they didn't even know their names. So that's what I was dealing with. Uh, now, you say in, in your book, you say that there were three things um, that, that kind of all happened about the same time to you, which had an everlasting impact on your, on your life as a pastor. One was um, kind of a, a time of self-awareness. One was a lecture. And one was a poem. Can you unpack these um, these three different things that, that happened in your life and kind of share with us how they came together um, and what came out of this? Well, I think the self-awareness was that I was not preaching. <laughs> I was, uh, I re- and I realized that after, oh, three or four months, um, I was copying things that I heard on the radio or television or something, and and I realized that I was not <clears throat> paying much attention to what the Bible said or what Jesus said, but what uh, elicited some kind of interest or just entertainment from a, from a congregation. So that was kind of self-awareness, just realizing I was being caught up in the, the world's idea of what it means to be successful and happy and productive. Uh, and the lecture was um, was at Johns Hopkins University. Um, I can't think of the name of the guy right now. He was um, from Switzerland. And uh, he was a doctor. But he had given up his his practice as a doctor and, and just um, started inviting people, got rid of the stethoscope and and would just invite um, people who were looking for help and uh, the way they lived and just listening to them. And uh, I realized that he was, uh, he had given up a lucrative practice for something that meant something to both him and the person, people he was talking to. And uh, that just cut the, my fascination with trying to be a consumer pastor. Right. And um, so uh, as we were, my wife was with me, and as we were um, driving home, I said, wasn't that? Didn't he have the? Didn't he speak just really good speech? And uh, it was just fascinating. And um, she said, "Well, he he was speaking in French." And uh, she said, "And Eugene, you don't even, you don't even know three words in French." <laughs> but he had a interpreter with him. And she was kind of um, stood in the background, just to 
four or five feet away from him and uh, was very unobtrusive. But she interpreted everything he said into English. And uh, I realized that something was more human. I mean, he was both the interpreter and, uh, and his his own voice um, went together. And uh, he wasn't doing this all by himself. And uh, so that was something that started to um, saturate me with a sense of what I wanted to do. Not find quick ways to give somebody some drugs or antibiotics, but to find out what they were like first and take his time doing it. And uh, that, I, that I was not doing that at all. That I was uh, in developing this new congregation. So that was it. And uh, Well, the poem was um, Gerard Manley Hopkins as Kingfishers Catch Fire. And uh, Hopkins had been a favorite poet of, poet, poet of mine for years and years. And uh, I often memorized his poems because they were so full of metaphor and um, color and rhythm. And so then that poem, as kingfishers catch fire, as dragonflies draw flame, um, they become, became kind of a text for me as I was preaching just to make sure I had the right metaphors and uh, the right rhythms, and so between the physician who would come and spoke to me in French, and Gerard Manley Hopkins, who he was a priest in uh, England, uh, they they became became kind of like school for learning how to preach. So I think that I was rescued from the consumer uh, mentality by the beauty of those, that poetry, by the honesty of the doctor. Well, that's powerful because as you listen to that and as you think through that, it's kind of one of the most unlikely places that you'd think that um, something would come through in that way. And, and as I have sensed across the years of your, of your ministry and through your writings that oftentimes um, – it is those unlikely places that that the voice of God breaks into our lives. Uh, it's not always, like you said, the the seminars on how to do this and how to do that, but it's those those smaller, more unlikely instances of life where the Spirit just speaks and and helps us um, take those steps into becoming the men and women that God created us to become. Exactly, Eugene. As I was reading your book, I was struck by how timely the sermons you were preaching at your church years ago in Maryland really address issues we are facing today. For example, in your message out of Job, you share that the easy answers of Job's friends are a cruel substitute for God himself. We live in an age abounding with such answers. Sometimes we talk them, sometimes we record them. Putting faith in education, technology, counsel, moral programs, and spiritual techniques. And then you go on to explain the solution for Job was not found in all these other things that we so often run to, right? But it was found in God and in listening to God's questions. Can you share with us why listening to God's questions is so important as we journey with him? People want want answers from God. And they keep, um, the pastors hear this all the time, why doesn't God answer my prayer? Why doesn't he do this and that? Um, But... What we want from God is uh, is something to do, something to make me better, something to uh, give me the answers to life. And what, we, what we're really after is to answer God ourselves. He's not there to give us answers. Those 49 sermons I, I preached for my congregation, um, I really just pick those up. I mean, those those sermons are all characteristic of all my preaching. And, uh, but I, I think if you read them closely, 
you don't find many answers there. You find, you find some openings for listening to God in a way which we would never have anticipated. And so preaching, uh, my, under, my understanding of preaching then was developed by reversing what the, is, was so common in American Protestantism of trying to treat God as, as an answer person. And we don't know enough about God to know what to ask. So we listen, and we listen, and we listen. And sometimes we have people like Job's counselors who, who uh, insist that he get the answers. But that doesn't, the way, it's not the way it works. So I think, um, and good preaching is always this way. Um, and, uh, but there's not very much good preaching these days. A lot of entertainment, a lot of stories. Now, I think the story is important, and I, I have lots of stories that get into my sermons, but uh, they're not the point of it. They're, the story is to make some identification with the humanity that uh, we carry around with us all the time. You know, people often will say, well, Jesus is the answer, and, and I've often said, well, Jesus is, is really the question. And if you look mm-hmm. at Jesus, Jesus was always um, helping people come to to wrestle with questions about life and about right. truth and about hope. And and um, and I I love what you're saying because I think if we begin to really focus on listening and and seeing what those questions are, um, that helps us to really dig more deeply into the life that God has for us, both as Christ followers on our journey, but then also as ministers and as pastors. As we're seeking to uh, to lead our congregations and um, and share the the hope of Christ with others, um, when we can encourage them to wrestle with questions, I see that there's a lot more growth that takes place, as opposed to trying to get um, a, you know a quick answer, which is oftentimes what our culture um, hungers for is those quick answers. Yeah, I agree. I agree totally. Now, as you look back across your decades of ministry. And then you look at the role of the pastor today, and you look at the contemporary church. I'm curious, what advice would you offer to pastors today? I think I start from the other end. Uh, I want to know what's, um, what they're doing, what they're feeling, what they're, <clears throat> what they're missing. And uh, usually what happens is uh, they discover it themselves. I don't think a pastor is there is in the business of um, just putting things out there and then expecting people to try it out and figure it out. Um, people are a lot smarter than uh, we think they are, and they they notice a lack. They notice they know they know something's wrong. They know something's missing. But they don't know what it is. But you don't either. And uh, so it's conversation is, a, I think, one of the most important things that pastors need how to, how to develop. Instead of t- telling people what to do, uh, asking them what they're doing. Um, I think pastors need to learn how to listen. Right. And, and then fill in the blanks. We don't need more words. We need accurate words. And what's better way to start off than something like the Lord's Prayer? I often, with my parishioners, would um, invite them to memorize psalms and then just when you're driving along or having a meal with somebody, those, those psalms um the Psalms are all prayers, but they don't, they don't always look like prayers. And uh, I think if we can saturate our lives with the words of Scripture, but not just, they're not just words, they're, they're prayers. They're, this is, 
these were people's lives getting articulated in ways that they would never, never guess what they're doing. So as you're speaking, uh, as you're speaking there to pastors and ministers, um, you're talking about you know that conversations are key. You know, knowing the people that God has entrusted to you is is important. And so yeah. the skill of listening, as you've shared, and has been really a hallmark of your ministry, that idea of listening is one of those skills that it seems you're saying that pastors should maybe spend more time on learning to listen than on just learning to, to talk. Would that be fair? Yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah. As pastors are, um, you know, just faithfully serving uh, where God has placed them and, and uh, kind of walking this journey with their parishioners, um, would you say that they are uh, should encourage one another to um, speak into each other's lives and to develop the sense of community? And that's that's where the Holy Spirit is able to work in in people's lives is through that sense of community. Would that be an important piece of this? Yeah, I think so. Here's a, here's a story that I think would illustrate something of what we're doing. Um, it was a young woman in our church who was a school teacher, and she was the teacher of one of my one of my sons. And she had a boyfriend. Um, I'll give him a fictitious name, Michael. And uh, he was the best athlete our little town had ever had. He he could do everything: football, baseball, soccer. And uh, and he went off to university and um, and he became a drunk. And uh, he was he was doing drugs a lot, and he and he was trafficking dr- in drugs. And then he finally got arrested and he was put in jail. And uh, after about five years, he uh, he was on parole. And he came back to his town, and uh, this this woman, young woman who was uh, had known him in his pre-jail days, he said he went to this his girlfriend at one point and uh, said, you know, I I think I'm a Christian, but I don't I have no idea what that means. But I was just I I was in my cell, and all of a sudden there was just this bright light around me, and I couldn't figure out what was going on, and what do you think? Do you think I'm a Christian? And she said, well, I don't, I don't know, but I have a, one of my students, is, her father is a preacher, so uh, let me ask him. So she did, and he, he told me what had happened, and he said, by the way, what is, there was somebody in, the, in my jail, jail cell left a bunch of little papers and uh, about a tizzy. What is a, what is a tizzy? And uh, I said, well, it's money that you give to the church, to Jesus, um, and it helps other people get healed and food on their tables and things like that. And she said, why don't you come and talk to my pastor? Um, so she did. He came and we talked and he, I told her what a tithy was. I already did that, I guess. <laughs> and, um, so I said, well, well, why don't we just have lunch, um, every couple of weeks and we'll just keep talking about this. And he, um, so he, <clears throat> we did and, and we, and we just, we just talked about his life and what was going on and. One day he said to me, don't people pray before they eat? And I said, well, yeah, yeah, many people do. Why aren't we praying? (laughs) And I said, well, Michael, (laughs) um, you know, I I know you're new at this whole thing. I just want to embarrass you in public. Well, uh, I'm going to (laughs) pray. So he prayed and yeah, we were having soup for lunch, and the, the waitress saw him with his head down over his soup, 
And she came back and said, is, is the soup cold? Is something wrong with the soup? And without opening his eyes, he just turned his face up towards her and said, we're praying. <laughs> and um, so that's how he started praying. <laughs> <laughs> but it, um, it took four or five months before that happened. And I'm not sure if I just started him out with, uh, with a tithy and a prayer that uh, it would have helped. All right. But then uh, he... He started going to AA, and it wasn't long. And then he he was exempted from his weekends in the in the jail. And uh, within um, oh six months, he had brought half the county into my into my church. Wow! It was you know he was a very gregarious guy. People loved him. He was funny skilled, but he was under the grip of this of heroin and other things, or had been. So um, there was a woman who came to my church <clears throat> during that time, and she told, told me that I, she was in AA. I said, well, I think you'd feel perfectly at home here. I mean, I have half a congregation is in AA. <laughs> And she said, well, I know, I know, I'd noticed that. So it's just, you know, surely he felt, I mean, he developed a congregation uh, that um, I could never have done by myself. Wow. I think pastors are, need to be more modest in what they're doing. I had a group of uh, pastors that uh, I gathered in, my, in our little town and uh, we'd meet every Tuesday for lunch, and we'd just bring in a, <clears throat> uh, sandwiches or whatever, and uh, we'd spend two hours together and just talk about the, what the pastoral life was like and how we could stay on track. They, there were about 14 of us, we took scripture lessons and read them and talked about them and tore them apart and whatever. And, but whenever anybody's, anybody had some problem, <clears throat> uh, divorce or sickness or runaway kids or whatever, we just drop everything and spend the rest of the time just letting these men and a couple of women well, we, we, they let us be their pastor. Let me put it that way. This this uh, went on for 17 years, 18 years. and uh, But these men uh, and one woman, they came up here to where we live now and for a, kind of a weekend of just reviewing what happened. And one of them said, you know, there's a, there's a story in Thomas Mann uh, about the woodsman. And he, sometimes the, the um, blade would break off and sometimes the handle would break off. And, but it was always the same shovel. And, uh, and they, this woman, it was a woman who said, you know, that's, that's what our company of pastors is. It's, it's always the same axe. Sometimes it's the handle, sometimes it's the blade, but it's always the same axe. And I thought that was quite wonderful. <laughs> right. That uh, we'd be, we'd be, we were able to maintain the continuity of what we were doing with each other uh, without diversion, without trying to get a new, new axe or something just keep the same old thing. So anyway, I think pastors, if they knew what it meant, would do a lot better job instead of just writing, trying to raise a, a crowd of people um, or get some special speaker who knows how to tell stories and, and then they go off and tell the same story as somebody else. But uh, I'm, 
I guess becoming a pastor, I realized how difficult it is to be a pastor because it's lonely business. Except when you have a fellowship of pastors like I had organized, uh, it's not lonely anymore. And we're not trying to oppress each other. We're letting each other get into our own skin and yeah, it's a it's a beautiful image to think of. You, you know, as as you're talking there, we see uh, lots of pastors. Um, you know, they fall, they have moral failings, and they get in, in into trouble. They make poor decisions. You know, some some very very harmful decisions um, at times. Uh, do you think that comes from um, oftentimes from them isolating themselves uh, rather than having some of the community that that you are able to enjoy with with your colleagues? Yeah, I think so. The, the isolation, uh, but I think it's also ambition. Being a pastor in, for so many people is competitive, and when you when you're competitive, you're uh, you're a lot more interested in winning than in uh, helping. Right. That all seems to come back to to a lot of what you you talk about is this idea of of building relationships. You know, kind of slowing down, building relationships, listening to one another, and and being willing to share with one another. And yeah. and oftentimes it seems like in the world in which we live, you know, things are so fast paced, and and like you said, there's a lot of that ambition, and it's almost like to slow down and to listen. Um, that's a discipline that you have to be intentional about. Yeah. It is. I think there's sometimes I'm I'm, I'm really encouraged. Sometimes I feel like uh, maybe we're taking taking a turn for the better and are more complete and, and develops develop more humility. One of the things I just I just have a, such a hard time of comprehending is why a pastor would want to speak to 5,000 people a week and not know anybody's name. And that just seems almost criminal, no matter how well they speak. If you've got 5,000 people listening to you, um, it's kind of like going to a football game. Uh, here, there's a lot of action that's going on, going on and a lot of yelling and swearing and everything else, but uh, you leave that football field and then you go on and do something else. And um, you shouldn't uh, shouldn't be doing that if you're a pastor. Clearly you're encouraging pastors to have those personal relationships, um, but we know that oftentimes pastors feel pressure to grow their churches, either from within or outside the church itself. What advice would you give to a pastor who's feeling that type of pressure? Well, um, my son is a pastor. Uh, he's 55, and he started a church, started a new congregation. And uh, he called up the other day. He said he's, he's a really a good pastor. He's a good preacher knows people, but he got a little, he called up and said, I've spent, I spent this week just calling on people cold. I just go up and knock on their door and go in and spend some time with them. And then he said, I feel more like a pastor than I've ever felt in my life. And I thought that was quite Wonderful, actually, because he he wasn't doing anything for them, but they were doing something for him. Mm. Which ended up being the same thing. Mm-hmm. It doesn't mean he's not a good preacher, he's not doesn't do well well in the pulpit, but it's entering into a world has community to it, and um, it puts shivers down my back, actually. Well. I think I didn't give him a stack of books to read first. 
Uh, you know, there's some, there's some great books on being a pastor, but they're all um, a couple hundred years old. Can I tell you my favorite pastor book? Yes, I'd love to hear it. In fact, I was going to ask if you'd share some of those with us so that we could kind of include those in the show notes so people could, could take a peek yeah. at some of them. Yeah, that'd be great. Let's hear. Uh, written by George Bernanos, a Frenchman. And uh, I picked this book up, Diary of a Country Priest. And when I was taking a trip someplace, and it was on an airplane, and I read this, and it was uh, about a, it was a, it's a Roman Catholic uh, setting. And this young man um, became a pastor in a, very difficult parish, and he was just so committed to, to doing this, and his superiors were making fun of him because he was not good looking and uh, was kind of clumsy. And uh, but he was just stubborn, uh, stubborn to please God. So I read that book, and I, I was it was early in my pastoral work, and I thought, you know, I'm going to be a I'm going to be a country priest, diary of a country priest. And he kept a diary this whole time. And then he died at quite a, at quite a young age of some disease, cancer, I think. And uh, so I came home, having done that, and then I read it again, and I read it again. And then at some point I realized it wasn't true. It was it was fiction. <laughs> <laughs> but I by that time I'd internalized a lot of it, so right. It became real for me and not fiction. So, but there are a few, few books like that that I keep and reread and reread. And of course, along with the Bible. So, how would you advise a pastor? who is under pressures such as growing the church, right, but struggles with finding time to practice the Sabbath or practice self-care? Take a long vacation. Mm. Alexander White was a Scots Presbyterian, uh, and one of his young students came to him. He's, he was a pastor in Satan, and one of the churches in Scotland for a long time. I don't think he ever changed changed churches. And uh, one of his young seminarians came to him one day and he said, Dr. White, what do you do to be a really good pastor? And he said, relieve yourself as often as possible and take a long vacation. <laughs> wow. But that, you know, there's a humor there, but there's a two, truth in it, too. Right. That you're not uh, doing something that's spectacular. You're kind of content to be in the ordinary. Right. I think one of the key things in my own life was my wife and I went to, um, oh, I can't think of his name right now, but anyway, it was a, he was a Quaker pastor, and uh, he urged us to take, take one day as a, as a Sabbath. So when we came, it was a three-day retreat, and uh, we came back and we decided we'd take a Monday Sabbath, Jan and I did. And we agreed that we would start it out, and we were in Maryland at the time, and there are, it was, there are wonderful trails and rivers and streams and so there was no lack of place to go and be quiet and we we would read a psalm drive to this whatever we, our destination was and read a psalm and then agree to not speak uh, until lunchtime so we did that we did that for years and years and years and we'd, Jan would pray before we started.
started out after our song, and and we would um, we were we were fascinated with birds and animals, and carried three or four books with us that helped us identify them, and then uh, and then the, when it was time for lunch, we'd find us a tree, a fallen tree, or a big rock, and eat our sandwiches, and then we'd talk the rest of the day as we went back home. But sometimes Jen would say, I don't want to talk anymore. I've got too much going on here. Oh. <laughs> and uh, we did that for a long, long time until our children were grown, and and then we, we still take long walks. We aren't always as quiet as we used to be. <laughs> what a beautiful, um, you know, just spiritual practice, and that goes goes again into the idea of of that that rhythm. Well, and it's it's not easy to do because the culture defines you in terms of your activity, how many souls you bring to God. You you've got to. I think you have to. That's why it's important, for me anyway, uh, to have some mentors in the cemeteries. The people who, oh, people who did it right before there were crowds of people to uh, become important in. So yeah, I think, uh, I think we all have a lot to learn, but we don't have to learn it from, from books or from other people, but we can just pay attention to the birds of the air and the fish of the sea and learn to appreciate what's going on and this marvelous creation we have. So anyway, we're together on this, I think. Yes, definitely, definitely. There's something to be said about the idea of presence, right? Mm -hmm. Just yeah, being right. being present. And, and whether it's you know on a long walk as, you, as you're looking at God's creation and allowing God to... to to speak into your life, or whether it's just being present as a pastor with someone who's going through a difficult time. I think that goes back to what we were saying earlier about not always having to have the answer, but just yeah. that idea of presence and, and what that means. It's beautiful, beautiful, brother. I thank you so much for um, taking time out of your afternoon to spend with me today. It's been a blessing to uh, hear your heart and um, just to be able to spend a little time and uh, gain a little from your wisdom. And I, I've definitely believe that our our listeners will um, will enjoy this conversation that we've been able to have and uh, will enjoy the the sermons um, that you're shared through your your new book as Kingfishers catch fire so thank you for for letting us um, have a look into your 29 years of pastoring there at that, that congregation and, and how you're speaking into their lives as God was speaking into your life certainly appreciate that thank you for your generosity and thank you to our listeners for joining us on today's episode. We certainly hope you enjoyed the podcast. And if you are indeed finding value from the Church of Leaders podcast, we'd appreciate you taking just a few moments to jump over onto iTunes and to leave us a review. Your positive reviews and ratings help other church leaders find our podcast so they can benefit as well. We thank you so much in advance. And until next time, this is Jason Day encouraging you to love well and lead well. You've been listening to the Church Leaders Podcast. For articles, videos, and free resources that will help you lead better every day, visit our website, churchleaders.com. Thanks for listening.